The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to today's webinar, Introducing Ideas Around Supply Chain 2020, with guest speaker Stephen Hanman. Supply Chain 2020 will incorporate best practices in the cultural and relation, rational dimensions, as well as the more typical technical aspects. At its best, the CS is a complex network that demands connected relationships and strategic management. Today's webinar will be exploring culture to do with leadership and management styles, introduction of the concepts of seamless supply chain from independence to interdependence, links to integrated business planning processes, uh, red apple hierarchy in contrast to the diverse cycle of the fruit. You will be placed on mute throughout the presentation, but if you're having any problems with connection or display, please use your question or, or chat function so I can help you out. We will be taking questions and answers during the presentation, so please start um, organising your questions. If you want to write them, please um, fill out the question dialogue and I will express that to Stephen. Otherwise, you can put your hand up and I'll unmute you so you can ask the question directly. Our guest speaker today is Stephen Hanman from Mirror Companions. Stephen Hanman has 30 years experience in supply chain and initially with CPL, they're then a pioneer of benchmarking success and now with Mirror and Collaborative Inquiry. Stephen's specialties include development of high performance workplaces, cultural change, conflict resolution and management, collaborative supply chain relationships, development of KPI management systems, facilitation of education, simulation and training programs, and coaching and mentoring. Stephen's style is facilitative and collaborative. Stephen, I'm sorry about that. That was terrible, but I'm over to you. So I'm going to change to your screen now. Can you please accept? How's that? Wonderful. Off you go. Okay, good uh, afternoon, I think it is to everyone. Um, I don't think there's any morning people because I can't see anyone from Western Australia, but if there are, welcome to everybody. Um, I'm going to run through um, some ideas that I've been um, working on for a number of years and um, it's about what the supply chain will look like by 2020 and what may become the norm. Um, and as you can see there from the title, um, Seamless is one of the focus, so is uh, Collaborative and probably most importantly um, it's what those two things <clears throat> may actually deliver in the supply chain which is what I'm calling high performance. So what I've done is produced a few slides here and as Wendy said, I'm happy to take questions as we go and we'll break um, after, after slide four and then perhaps after slide 10 if there are any questions. So feel free to um, uh, deepen the conversation. Um, some of you may know, but I used to be the pioneer, I was the pioneer of a company called Benchmarking Success, which was a supply chain benchmarking business and we used to run peer groups so where different people from different organisations came together and met four times a year. So lots of the ideas that I'm presenting here are part of that journey and now my work is about building those types of supply chains in client-based organisations. So let's move to um, just an overview. <coughs> so um, what I'm talking about here is that um, seamless type supply chains which means there's no silos. So the idea of seamless is there's no silos, which then suggests there's no duplication um, and people are trusting from one department to another, which um, is a challenging concept but certainly one that's becoming more common and I think will become more common over the next uh, 5 to 10 to 20 years. The other aspect is it's collaborative both within your business 
So that means you're getting on with people in other departments, but also starting to collaborate with those external parties which offer strategic value to you. So that could be suppliers um, <clears throat> and other stakeholders. And so, for example, um, it could be raw material suppliers. Um, it could also be third, uh, 3PLs um, like Linfox, Toll and the like <clears throat> out there, which I'm working on at the moment um, with Dulux Group. Um, and so the idea with these um, supply chains will be that they'll be driven by a high performing and one definition of high performing is emotionally intelligent. The idea is that everybody probably gets their job because their resume and their IQ has a lot to do with that, their intellectual capacity. But these high performing supply chains and teams are actually driven by emotionally intelligent people. So one part of my work is developing up emotional intelligence and building bridges for people from where they are to what they can be. And Thankfully, emotionally, emotional intelligence is something people develop um, as they move forward in their career. Surprisingly, it can peak um, early on in your life, which is about 28, um, but then it can continue to, to develop. So the whole theme behind Seamless is the idea of interdependency. So rather than independence, which is predominantly the driver of most in organisational life, this is saying that supply chain chains run across departments rather than down departments. Organisations are structured vertically, but they actually operate horizontally. <clears throat> so as a leader, you need to develop both those skills in the vertical, so positional, but also um, horizontal leadership, which is about how you manage different interfaces across the business. So that's the big picture. Um, I've broken that up into um, some three areas and today is about this first one which is understanding the past and the present supply chain, um, looking at it from adversarial and fear based, looking at concepts like independence to interdependence, so from me to we, and then sort of mapping the path to the future so you have something to take away with today. So the second webinar that I'm doing is about building specifically high performance teams and talking about emotional intelligence. And then the third one is about partnering with the third party logistics provider and it's using the global supply chain forums partnering model which identifies strategic value of why you would partner and what sort of partnership you'd want with another organisation. And then being able to build those components together so it delivers the value that's been promised. So that gives you a snapshot of the three. So we'll go back to that point one and look at those specific issues. Um, what I've started with is uh, something that I've used for years, which is looking, looking at an organisation and its supply chain from the perspectives of outputs. So the two in the right hand corner at the bottom, um, awareness of an optimal cost structure is one output, so the cost base of the supply chain. And then the other one that's critical is the service levels delivered by the supply chain, so delivery in full on time to the customer. Obviously there's many ways to measure that, but DIFOT is the most well known and Perfect Order has been around for about 10 years. So I'm saying that you know, best practice is an optimal cost structure with a service level above 85% delivered in full on time based on the customer's first request. So not negotiated, but customer's first request. Then the other um, jigsaw pieces here are about what I call um, inputs, so supply chain inputs. So they start from that strategic intent of the leadership, um, creation and deployment of a plan. So in there we're talking that there's a, a vision, which is why we're going to turn up and do what we do. And how we're going to do it in terms of values and behaviours and then the what is actually the strategic plan of the actions and that's obviously supported by things like cultural aspects which is down at the bottom there empowered people committed to change and also about um, strong functional links and then also a process focus um, and from my perspective they're sorts of things that you managing a supply chain can consider um, in the pursuit of improving your supply chain. So we've got the outputs and we've got the management inputs. Um, 
for each of you to consider where you might be on that journey. So moving, um, taking that sort of outcomes focused, which is probably what most of you get paid to do, which is deliver an output. So I'm saying that service, and this is from uh, Benchmarking Success, 19% of supply chains uh, deliver 97% delivery in full by line. Um, and only eight of those match that with on-time delivery above 97%. So in terms of um, the customer's first request, only 4% are doing that in terms of that service requirement. And then how many of those are doing it at an optimal cost? About half of those. So from the benchmarking success database, which is you know began in 1993 and is still valid today, about 2% of supply chains achieve this world-class DIFOT and low cost or optimal cost environment. Uh, I thought I would just stop there if there's any questions in terms of that content, Wendy? No, Stephen, please proceed. Okay. <clears throat> so um, if we take those, um, a picture of the strategic and looking at outputs in terms of service and cost and then the inputs that you in your work are either creating or working with, one of the critical ones is the idea of workplace culture. Um, so what I've got here is the human synergistics picture and they detail three workplace cultures and maybe you can spot yourself, your organisation or previous organisation. So the, the best one is what's called a constructive style, so where the organisation individuals pursue excellence, where people maintain their personal integrity, people support each other and they cooperate with each other. And then the two um, others that are spoken about, less positive, less constructive than that first one. First one is, the second one is um, the passive defensive style. And that is an organisation where people go along with others and they tend to not rock the boat because there's no future in rocking the boat. The culture is you, um, it's more vertical and hierarchical and you don't get a lot of input from people below. So please those in positions of authority and in that environment we wait for others to act first. So you can see they're probably not the most innovative. Um, people keep their heads down, they tend not to give feedback and it tends not to be asked for. So it creates an environment where there's a passive defensive um, culture. The third one, a little bit stronger, is the aggressive defensive style where people actively oppose ideas, they play politics to gain influence, um, they compete with each other rather than cooperate. So if we go back to the concept of seamless or collaboration, obviously this culture has limited collaboration across the departments and there tends to be a bit of silos and empires. And um, yes, we see plenty of organisations like it but in this sort of today's world where it's complex and connected, uh, these types of organisations are finding it very difficult to stay with the more agile, faster movers. So moving on from that idea of the three types of cultures, um, you think, um, you know, so this human synergistic research, this is what everybody wants. Okay, so all their research says that people all know that they want to live in this constructive style where achievement is high, self-actualising, humanistic, encouraging and affiliative. So that's what everybody wants. So everybody's really clear about what they want in organisational life. Um, and there's four different types um, of those cultures. So let's contrast that with the actual in terms of how people behave and how they're encouraged to behave. And that is the opposite. So rather than the constructive style being predominant, it means that the aggressive defensive styles and passive defensive styles are the most common in organisational life. So it creates a question, why if we want it, is it so difficult to create? And that's sort of the focus of the next part of this session. So perhaps a question for you, um, you know, where you currently work at the moment, where do you see your organisation? And you may also then consider your own style and, and see whether that's aligned with where the organisation is or whether you're trying to do something different. <clears throat> okay, 
so a summary of those styles, uh, and I've only listed four there, but there are others. So now I'd like to move on to, um, I'm, uh, I authored a book called um, From Me to We Design and Build Collaborative Workplaces, um, and you'll see that link there, Collaborative Inquiry. You can download a free copy of the book from there. Um, and as you can see the fruit, um, my co-author, who was the CEO of the Integrated Property Development Company, he did this presentation to demonstrate to the 50 people in the room. There were um, people from eight different organisations, he the builder and, and the property developer, but also um, architect, engineer and all the suppliers, all the critical strategic suppliers. There were seven suppliers chosen who he asked to become part of the circle and did not have to tender. So basically a budget-based process and he brought them into the inner circle. So I've given you two pictures here. One is what he called the red apple hierarchy and he's the person on the top with the two leaves. Um, and um, the hierarchy is not the problem, uh, but as Deming, the quality guru said, the real challenge is that people start to think that they're better than people below them. And often that includes suppliers. So the thinking starts to be hierarchical and that's why it tends to be adversarial and not collaborative. The picture to the right um, is really an alternative of the hierarchy. Okay, And I'll talk to that a little bit uh, more in the next couple of slides, but it's just another depiction. But you can see on the right, it's a step, uh, it's a development step from the hierarchy because everybody is on an equal playing field. Okay. So there's more equality in the picture to the right than there is to the left, but you can see the person on the top uh, has moved across to be in the centre of that system. Um, and what we're going to talk to, what we're going to talk about now is how that might uncover opportunity for you in your role. Um, so in contrast, he had a diverse circle of fruit. Um, obviously, I've got here multiple, multiple versions of fruit. He had just um, six or seven different types of fruit, which he put in a circle like the one on the right-hand side there. Okay, And he took himself and put himself in the middle because he said that he couldn't have anarchy. He needed to create the collaborative system to enable people to work like this. And what was interesting is that every one of these suppliers wanted to work like this, and perhaps that was obvious because they were promised work for the next five years. Um, and delivered significant value to their organisation. But interestingly, after a five-year period of more than $150 million of construction, a quantity surveyor um, analysed the contracts and found that there was a 7% reduction in the construction cost. And Ian, who was the CEO, had never asked anybody to reduce their prices. So there were no tenders, but these contractors who were part of this circle started to reduce their prices because the waste started to disappear from the system and they started to reduce their prices while making the same margin. So it was quite an exceptional outcome. Um, now, if we take this then into your um, picture of leadership and how you lead, um, I've given three different styles here. So the first one, and I think I think you'll, this slide's not animated, but if you take the first step and just the, sp the spokes which aren't connected, the manager is in the middle and they manage each one of their direct reports. So a little bit like the red apple and all the green apples um, in the previous slides. So in this environment, everything goes through the leader or the manager. So it's management by control. The process tends to be slow as it moves up and down each spoke and then it's communicated out when needed. And so the manager's making that decision in terms of the communication flow. So important at different moments that this style, so if there's an emergency, someone needs to use management by control to get everyone out of the building and safe. Um, but in many other situations, this doesn't empower the team members to be the best they can be, and it limits the team in terms of their leadership capability because everything's controlled by the manager in the middle. So a first step for you to consider, or what happened in our project, was this second step whereby the team members 
were now connected. So the leader in the middle, still in the middle, has now created an environment where all his direct reports are now part of a team and they're meeting on a regular basis, whether that's weekly, a stand-up meeting for half an hour or a monthly session or whatever, whatever works for the team. But the idea is that now the person in the middle is starting to share the story with everyone else in the direct reports and that's creating an environment whereby leadership now is becoming shared because that leader in the middle will be good at some things but not everything and there will be people in the outside of that circle who are better at perhaps the technical or perhaps some relational or perhaps communication or marketing aspects. So the idea is that in this step there's now one-to-one -one interaction between the manager and each of the direct reports but there's also a team connection and interaction so they start to share what's going on. Um, and with that they start to uh, remove the duplication that often exists when it's in the one-to-one -one interaction. So we start to get a team, challenges the leader to share some leadership Okay, and one example, I've got a general manager of procurement and he is, he was in the first step and he moved to this second step and he saved himself one day per week because he was no longer managing by control and what he found was that his role changed quite dramatically because individual people started to take on things that they were best at and they could, they could shine and they might have been things that he wasn't um, the best at and so he nurtured them to do that and he started to work more strategically as a boundary rider, so stepping out of the centre and started to be a boundary rider around the circle so he could hold the space of his team and create an environment where everybody started to work together in a very constructive environment. Um, and the third step, which is, so this is exactly what we did in this collaborative construction project that I spoke about. Um, the third step is that the manager or leader chooses to take the next step in the development of the team, so a high performing team, where the person who's the leader steps out of the centre and becomes and creates a quality. And so he's equal with everyone else. He's equal as a human being, that's why they've all got hearts. He's not equal in terms of his authority level to make decisions. So to, the two things can coexist. So if we work with values and behaviours, everyone can look after each other the same, respectfully, everybody does what they say, we're open and honest. Um, and the leader can once again be that boundary rider to ensure that everyone's looked after, everybody's doing their job, so we need very strict performance standards. Um, but now what we've got is a far more dynamic process and the leader has to nurture that environment and has to invite the expert into the centre. And so the idea is that the person who's the expert on the topic, so let's say it's a procurement question or a distribution question or a customer service question, that person steps into the centre and the supply chain leadership team leader, the supply chain director actually stays on the outside and listens and observes the system that is the supply chain and then responds um, accordingly in terms of what the strategic aims are and what's needed in the business. So there's a dynamic movement of people in and out of the circle. Um, it still needs to be carried or facilitated by the leader, um, but sometimes the leader's not the best facilitator, so it could be somebody else and that could be nominated in the group. And so I've given a fourth step there, which is, um, the outer circles of influence are then brought into the circle. So you can imagine circles on each each of these people and that would then bring in, to, in a more seamless supply chain process with the organisation. So Wendy, I thought I'd stop there and see if there's any questions again. No, no questions at the moment, Steve, so keep going. Okay. Um, so if we take this step two, and third step, um, as the changes that are required, what, it, what it's suggesting is that the leader needs to have more than management by control at his fingertips as a style to lead. And so if we take Hager 
group, I think they talk about seven different styles, which includes um, affiliative and direct and pace setter and visionary, etc. So they're different styles for the different situations. And the idea is that if the leader in the third step is sitting on the outside observing the space, they make the decision about which leadership style is relevant for the moment. And the idea here is that we're keeping everybody engaged and committed to the task at hand and motivated. And in that environment, the discretionary effort that people have at their disposal is put into the organisation. So the organisation is far better off. There's lots of research um, highlighting that those cultural aspects um, are actually what creates this high performing environment and high performance organisation. So it's a, it's a shift in leadership style that allows the leader to dance uh, whatever dance is required at that time. And he knows what's required or she knows what's required by actually requesting feedback from other people in the team all the time. If it's engaging and motivating, keep doing it. If it's demotivating or disengaging, something's amiss. Um, so let's then apply the idea of that type of leadership, so either the step two or the step three, um, to the idea of a seamless supply chain. So at the bottom, I've given one example of a supply chain that includes procurement, manufacturing, distribution, customer service and supply chain planning. So the first step in an organisation might be to ensure that within each of those functions everybody works together. So if there's multiple manufacturing sites, is there sharing of knowledge, is there collaborative environment? Same for distribution, same for customer service and procurement. And once you start to develop a seamless approach within a supply within the supply chain, then the idea is that um, you know, in an organisation where there are multiple strategic business units, so that's what an SBU is up the top there, you can start to apply this seamless supply chain as a value add to each of the SBUs. So rather than the SBU having to go to individual people in the supply chain, they can actually go to one person who now represents the whole supply chain. So it makes for a very much more powerful supply chain capability. And what it does mean is that everyone in the supply chain starts to be aware of what everybody else is doing and capable of doing. So if we go back to the leadership styles in the previous slide, we're working with this step three or two where people start to understand each other and start to care about each other's success. Um, so rather than a, um, a focus that's on the function only, what we're talking about now is that we're talking about a broader interest um, in other departments in your area and ultimately then um, strategic business units whereby the supply chain is offering services to them. So in this example, it might be manufacturing a range of products or the like. So that's the concept of seamless supply chain. So it is about removing the silos, getting people to work together, um, building a capability based on the high performing teams and the leadership styles. Um, and the overall picture there is one whereby we start to add, so everybody's, we want everybody to be independent and be responsible, self-responsible for their own job and look after that job themselves without having a manager standing over them. But once we get to that point where there's a good degree of independence, we then start to focus on the interdependence, which means that people start to see things upstream and downstream. And rather than just self-interest, which is the independent picture, they start to have an interest in the other. So we create um, a different mindset and a different feeling around what success looks like. And it's consistent with this idea of a cross-functional process which is what we know the supply chain is. It's not one silo, but it's multiple. We need to break down those silos and create one process. So interdependence is the phrase that I think will become more and more common um, over the next five to 10 to 20 years. And already we can see things like sales and operations planning is based on the concept of interdependence. That's now evolved into integrated business planning. And integrated business planning 
suggests more seamlessness in the organisation because now we're including finance and other areas that um, historically weren't included in SNOP, which was the which was the balancing of demand and supply. We're now adding in integrated business processes the idea of value as well as volume and mix. We've now got value, <coughs> and we start to challenge the idea that we need to do a budget, for example. Um, so this one is just obviously the fruit example is obviously that people are different. We're not all red apples. We're actually all different and sometimes we forget that everybody's different and we don't put enough time into building connections and relationships. And the idea here is that um, we need to slow down to go fast. So my experience of successful collaborations is that they do the work up front in building relationships and building capability. So then when difficulties arise, which they always do, that conflict can be resolved much more easily because we know each other, because we actually have some trust in each other because people are doing what they say. We start to care for each other, which means we care if we stuff someone up. And then we start to have the courage to have conversations that we normally wouldn't have. So once again, we go back to that step three um, in that leadership style. Um, so one example of that, which I thought may be valuable for everybody here, is a process that we use called an interface hotspot, uh, an improvement process. So those circles are the different departments in a business, and each one of the greens are the interface or the handover from one department to another. That's um, often a bit of a dark space, a black hole. No one's quite sure who should do what to whom and when. So the idea of making these interfaces more visible and conscious um, is the idea about a interface conversation. Think about it as a contrast to the one-on-one -on -one performance review that organisations do. This is a department to department review about who's doing what to whom. Um, and I came back yesterday from a three month, three months ago we ran an interface conversation between manufacturing and planning and manufacturing and distribution. And it was three months on and we looked at whether the interface is now healthy and providing opportunities for more improvement as they sort themselves out. So just to, to further that picture, the idea is that we act forward in an organisation. One department does something and hands it on to someone else, ultimately to the customer. But often we don't get time because we're too busy to actually think about the process, the cross-functional process. So the whole idea of an interface hotspot and improvement process is to create an environment where we look at whether the interfaces are working and we actually identify what we could do to improve it. And then we give that group of people who are the process people the authority um, in the management by support model, so not management by control, but in that step two and step three, to go and fix the problems. So the idea is that the leader and the manager is there to remove the constraints for the process people to make the interface better and to make the process more effective, more efficient, which will be experienced by the customer in delivery in full on time, but also in terms of reduced cost and cost per line or, or cost to serve type approach. Um, so there obviously should be feedback loops, but often in the busyness they get lost. So this is the idea of an interface conversation. So I'd suggest, you know, an annual process of interfaces. Often the first one takes a long time to do because very rarely do you get two departments being honest with each other about how things are. And once you've done it once, you change the culture of the interface and you change the culture of the departments and you can actually change the culture of the organisation because it starts to think about interdependence, not independence. And obviously that challenges the idea of performance measurement and all sorts of things that are and structure. It's all driven by departments rather than horizontal processes. Um, okay, so that's the idea of the interface conversation. Um, let me just finish off in terms of summary. Organisational existence demands we harness the complex connected world for our advantage. Um, starts with the people and we need a culture to do it. 
we need this constructive culture that has the ability to have flexibility in terms of leadership style, so people can switch styles, so people stay engaged and motivated. And from the red apple hierarchy to the diverse circle of fruit. Um, and in that environment, seamless supply chains will become more common and integrated business planning processes are driving that. Um, and people will start to work on a day-to-day -day basis with their known interdependencies. So, you know, we all know that we're interdependent, but very rarely do organisations take into account that reality. So that's the change that I think will happen over the next, that's been happening. Sales and operations planning is an example and that's been around for 20 years. But it often doesn't go down to the execution level and that's where the culture of seamless supply chain will play out. Um, and obviously, you know, for people to take away, they can actually build these bridges from this step one to step two and three leadership styles. So one of them is to um, understand the philosophy and the change, but then to build the skill sets required. Um, so emotional intelligence is something I do with individual people and then we build bridges and help them make that transition and lots of success comes out of that development of emotional intelligence because the whole focus is with more emotional intelligence, I can use more leadership styles because I'm not reacting, um, I can be proactive. And then lastly, the interface conversations, and we'll talk next time about high performance teams, which is obviously another bridge. Um, and that last slide just talks about what we're going to perhaps cover in webinar two and three. So over to you, Wendy, for questions. Thanks, Stephen. That was great. No, we don't have any questions, so you must have done that very well. Um, look, I'd like to thank, uh, extend a great thank you to uh, Stephen Hanman for today's presentation and look forward to you all joining us for the next topic on Friday the 19th of August, high performance teams using an updated Tuckman model of forming, storming, norming, maturing, customising and innovating. If you have any further questions on this presentation, please contact me and I'll put um, the questions on to Stephen for you to, uh, to be answered. Thank you very much for attending today and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you.